Vault Dwellers, Wastelanders, welcome back to the Fallout Lorecast. This is your source for everything having to do with Fallout. And I'm your host, Tom or Robots. And normally I'd say I'm here with my co host, Lainey or Neos Pandora. But if you listen to last week's episode, she has moved on to video editing and recently has launched our first lore video. It is up now on the Robots. Well, actually, no, it's up on the Fallout Lorecast YouTube channel because we've now split everything out to their own channels. So go look up the Fallout Lorecast YouTube channel for our first lore video. It's based on the lore section of the first episode of this podcast with all new actual video footage edited by Lainey herself. It looks awesome. We've been getting some very, very positive responses to that video. Go check it out. And if you want to do us a favor to help that get that channel growing, please go watch the video, watch it all the way through, give it a like, give it a share, comment on it. YouTube doesn't know what to do with new videos and new channels until enough people actually watch the video. So please go check it out. But um, she did an awesome job and, you know, comment on there and tell her she did an awesome job. She would love to hear it. But we're back with a new episode. And when I say we, I mean me and my guest host for today's episode episode dave laney chapins two. laney Wait. two also known as dave chapins from west virginia and the internet and the starfield lore cast my co-host from the starfield lore cast welcome back dave chapins you've been on the show before people might remember mm-hmm. you from some episodes mm-hmm. how you doing buddy also oh doing- also the the fallout hub man we do so many things together like we're just listen we're holding hands <laughs> constantly like people people may start wondering people may start suspecting something we're both married men so we need to you know we need to chill out maybe sometime there are there was a time and there are cultures where it's okay for married men to hold hands and skip through the fields you know the lilies and things it's <laughs> that's okay it's totally it's all right. fine it's all good and dandy but i've, I've been doing well man uh, i'm glad to be back on um and this time not strangely talking about mothman this is like yeah normally when you it's kind of like uh, ghostbusters like when there's a ghost you call <laughs> ghostbusters it's like uh-huh. when tom wants to talk about a mothman he calls me but we're not talking about the t- today so maybe i'm good for other things Who yes knows? yeah well we're gonna find out this is this is the challenge here is are you good for anything other than mothman <laughs> yes <laughs> so i like it so we're starting a new series for the show because we're moving on from some of the stuff we were doing before we're going to put some of the Fallout New Vegas lore on hold. There's plenty of more lore to talk about with New Vegas. Heck, there's plenty of more lore to talk about from any of the Fallout games. But that that stuff will come. The time will come to talk about that stuff because it's nearing the end of the year. And I want to piggyback on one of the coolest series that came out this year. Marvel's What If series. If you watched the What If series, you you might have enjoyed it. It. It was a a concept where they took uh, and they animated some ideas around what if some of the concepts around the Marvel movies were changed around a little bit. What if there was an alternate universe where things didn't happen the way we knew them to happen? And we're going to play with that concept today and in some of the future episodes of the show. And I hope you guys enjoy it. And I want you to go along with with us on this on this mental journey because there's a lot of significant points and significant things that happen in the story and in the lore of Fallout. One of them has to do with the vaults. And today's question is, what if the vaults were safe? And we're gonna we're gonna play with this concept a little bit. We're gonna take it and move it around. There's different ways to interpret this, but we're gonna start out with this idea that what if the vaults were safe and as we know in the world of fallout the vaults are designed as experiments and oftentimes the people who are being experimented on one don't know that they're being experimented on and two the experiments aren't particularly safe for those people who are being experimented on and three oftentimes even the overseers the people who know what what is going on it's not even necessarily safe for them either. There are nefarious things afoot in the vaults. So, Dave, I've got some things to th- I've got some ideas here about what mm-hmm. would happen in the world of Fallout from the point of the Great War on over the next 100, 200 years where the games take place. If we had an end of the world, a wasteland where we have a, vun- a bunch of vault dwellers that went into a bunch of vaults 
and they ended up in a safe situation. So I know you have some thoughts on this. I'm going to let you go ahead and mm -hmm. open this up. What What is one of your first thoughts about this scenario? My, my first question, and, and it's more like a, more like a caveat, I would say, mm -hmm. is um, mm -hmm. who is going into the vaults? Right. Like it, in, a, in a safe scenario where there's like no experience, like obviously, you know, for the vaults where it's like we're going to do nine, nine women and one man or, you know, they're, they're yeah. looking for particular types for certain things. But if they're all just um, safe and there's nothing weird going on, um, how would they like what's their stipulation for putting people into vaults? Right. Well, so we could play through this scenario in a few different ways. Mm -hmm. One could be that there are no experiments happening in the vaults that would okay. be a hundred percent safe right mm -hmm. a second scenario would be that experiments are still happening in the vaults but they're only happening with the expressed approval of those people being experimented on that it, there's no surprises the people who are being experimented on are going into those situations a hundred percent knowingly they know what they're going into they know they're signing off on it just like just like any like ethically moral experiment in today's society you you go to the university they give you a paper it explains exactly what's going to be happening what things you're going to be aware of what things you're not going to be aware of you're signing off on it and you know that and in, in the end that they are they will call off the experiment if ever anyone's safety is in question right mm -hmm. so in a so in a, in a scenario like you're explaining here like with the you know 99 women and one man there would be safety uh restraints in place if ever any of the women or that man's safety came was in, in danger then the experiment would be called off so they would have they would have guards they would have uh probably cameras they would have the ability to you know, basically watch over whatever was going on and should any of the people in the experiment say use a safe word or hit a button to say i feel threatened in this moment they would call off the experiment in that moment right then right for for yeah. whatever the duration of the experiment is so in that in that scenario it would be 100 percent safe they could call off the experiment at any point i think i think that's a good point and i think that um I, I guess the thing that would initially, even before you start cracking open vaults at, at like after the war, whenever you start cracking open vaults, there's automatically an us and them mentality of people that go into the vaults and people that stay out. And you right. see that at the beginning of Fallout 4 with the um, vault tech uh, sales rep, right? Like yeah. he is very, he's like, hey, wait a second, I work for you all. Why can't I go in there? Right. I yes. want to go in there. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, let me in. Let me in. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. They won't let them in. So, so point one, I guess, is that it doesn't solve an us and them mentality. You still have the people who go into the vault and you still have the people who don't. Um, so why don't we why don't we break this down? Let's let's sure. go. Let's go into like the most the most safe version of this would be that the vaults don't have any experiments at all. They are exact exactly what the public would expect them to be. They are homes underground that are safe from bombs there is nothing else going on than just safe places to go and based on the societies that you live on underground when the society underground deems that it is safe to come back to the surface then you can go back to the surface it's as simple as that how would like the world it. change how how what would what would the events of say fallout 1 or fallout 3 or fallout 4 or 76 be like if that was what was going on i think that uh, i think that uh, if we're taking like a player character like like if we're, if we're saying the play character from four or three or new vegas or whenever mm -hmm. um comes out he's got his vault suit on and is starting to talk to people people are going to automatically think that this is some rich guy like this yeah. is a guy that we have all been out here like surviving where like half of us are ghouls some people got taken by the super mutants other people are being kidnapped by raiders and, and and what have you and from that from that starting point like in the in the games like they're always curious they're like what kind of experiment did they do with you in the vault because everybody knows that the vaults were experiments and so without that caveat i think people are going to be way less um uh, trustful and have way less social capital with people that are vault dwellers after they open up Right. Do you think that the the uh, surface dwellers, the uh, 
the wasteland we'll call them just wastelanders would mm-hmm. see the vaults once i mean they would know the people who were surviving would know that the vaults in that case are extremely valuable i mean there's that sense of like oh if you could find a vault and get into it then you're you're going to be safe but most of the time they can't but as time goes by and more and more vault dwellers are showing back up on the surface and they aren't crazy and they aren't you know like coming mm-hmm. out messed up because over time they are but in this, in this case they're not they're well fed they are basically psychologically well kept in more more likely than not um th- these are treasure troves uh the, the chances are that the the vaults themselves are better designed to survive because they're not designed for experiments they're 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 not lacking water like some of the vaults are or lacking power and you know set to break down or have all of a certain type of person and not enough of another type of person or lacking engineers or like you know whatever have music repeating over and over again or you know any of the weird experiments that are going going on so they are treasure troves of food and power and water and all sorts of things on the surface wouldn't wouldn't the wastelanders be like constantly seeking out vaults in order to get in or to take them for themselves that that's a that's a really good point and it makes me it makes me wonder how like how vaults would assimilate into culture like if i'm thinking about like points of resource if you're opening up into a wasteland and I've had a I've had a, a genuinely good experience. I've had a, like five star review on Yelp at, at the at the local vault. <laughs> right. I'm most likely going to continue to live in the vault, except be a part of society itself. It's almost like uh, a, a big uh, apartment complex, like uh-huh. in in that aspect. Like if 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 I'm somebody like that, I'm like yeah. Like if for if Vault seventy six opened and we're allowed to just live in it, like everyone would just live in Vault seventy. Like yeah, everyone would just hang out because there are power. There's running water. There's um, a lot of resources there. And to me, like I think that even though like wastelanders would be looking for that stuff, I think that people with the vaults would have enough insight, at least into maybe sociology or economics, being like, hey, we've got to do this slowly over time. Mm-hmm. and say you know we're not just going to open the doors one day and we're all going to like pop out it's like we've got to take a few people at a time figure out what like set up some trading essentially you're making your own town at that point at least from my perspective that's what i think would happen i don't think that people would set off and because a lot of people leave vaults and are like yeah that place sucked i'm never going there again you know yeah yeah, yeah well I, I would assume that the vaults would then have their own means of uh, creating food I mean, often they have their own power sources. They have their own water purifications. They would probably have their own hydroponics uh, food, right. food, you know, to be able to maintain that. Also, they would have their own engineers to maintain a vault for long periods of time and to pass down education to from generation to gen- generation. Uh, one of the thoughts I had is that they would probably leave the vault. So let's say you're in a vault and you decide that you're not going to leave or you're going to test leaving each generation, every, let's say every, even maybe even every 10 years, you send scouts out into the world and they, they come back and they go, nope, still dangerous out there. Not worth not worth heading out. And at 50 years later, nope, still dangerous out there. 100 years later. Yeah, still dangerous out there. Eventually, at what point do you, you start expanding the vault? At what point do you just start mining out more passages underground and you, you create what is basically an ant farm community underground you, you become dwarves basically and you start mining <laughs> hole. <laughs> you, you, you have like a hobbit hole community that t- takes whatever resources you can and starts building out using the engineering and and eventually you probably run out of extra space depending on the, the nature of the rocks and and the uh, materials you have to build or the amount of power you have to grow but if if you have enough plants you can just keep planting hydroponics if you have enough water, you can just keep on using more water. But at some point you run out of resources and then eventually you have to expand into the surface or you have to limit the amount of children that you can have. That's that's the point where you have to expand onto the surface. Then all of a sudden you're dealing with people in dire circumstances who aren't afraid to take what you have. That's where you come across the raider gangs who are a threat. And that's where you come across like this dilemma of like, how do we expand on the surface? Um, 
the next step I would I would start to consider is do the vault dwellers and and many vaults are actually in fairly close proximity to each other. Like in in an area like Boston, you have a number of vaults that are all within walking distance from each other. Right. So do these communities start to work together in order to try to organize some way of revitalizing a larger outdoors community? Do they yeah. start trying to re-educate the out, outer world population? Do they, you know, like, how does that work? And and I guess the greater question is, in the outside world, you still have irradi- irradiated swaths of land. You still have mutated monsters. You still have factions that are trying to vie for power and don't care who they step on. I I, I think the really big question here is, does the vault community actually have enough power amongst themselves to become their own faction in this type of fallout world? I think that's, I think that's a great point. And I think that, I think that they all have shared experience. They all have um, the same amount of resources. Um, If we look at, um, you know, you're talking about hobbit holes and uh, dwarves that live in mountains in like D and D and, and like Lord of the Rings. Like they all stay in their mountains yeah. and come down if they need something. But generally, they come down in a pack and they're pretty fortified whenever they do. Right. Um, I, I think that I think if the vault people of that are in the vault tech vaults all got together and decided, okay we're all going to look out for each other. We're going to do, you know, help each other out in certain ways and send, you know, convoys of, of, you know, people. I mm-hmm. think that you have like a faction that could rival the Enclave or Brotherhood of Steel very easily. Yeah. Or even underground <laughs> passages. Like, couldn't they mine out underground passages from one vault to the next? Theoretically. That's true. Yeah, they could. They could. Yeah. And then you could have this entire network of, of vaults underneath, say, Boston, where each of those vaults is like communicating with each other because they're secure enough in themselves and because they're not all messed up, you know, they're, they're not all mm. reeling with the inability to manage themselves theoretically. Now, some of them right. aren't going to be perfect. Some of them are going to have bad leadership. Some of them are going to fall apart from inside. But even even if 50 percent of them work out pretty well, you could have an, an organized system where they they can unite together and work together theoretically because right. th- because you don't have a system where they are all in dire need of resources where they're all competing with each other and that's usually where humanity falls apart or at least it does in this series is where mm-hmm. everybody's vying for the same resources another question that i i kind of had was how does this affect other how would this affect other factions um if if Voltec's not like lying and doing these experiments and doing this kind of this kind of thing that it, further engenders distrust. If people come out of that system, wastelanders realize, Hey, you know what? These people are pretty good. They're like, they've got their stuff together. They have followed a plan set by the standards and they're rolling with it. Are, are there going to be people more interested in, in like a group like the enclave or the brotherhood of steel? Like, are those going to get more, um, you know, are, are, are their view numbers going to go up because uh-huh. they are associated with the government and with these like very strict rule systems and um, and resources? Yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know. Like, would would the Brotherhood feel like they have some claim on the vault as technology? Or would the Enclave feel like they have some claim on the vault society as uh, an outgrowth of uh, a system that was created by the U.S. government in the past? And right. so they, I they have some I don't claim think on that them. the Brotherhood or Enclave would be very happy with the vault dwellers and would not if they if they were a faction, mm-hmm. they would hate each other. Like right. they could not coexist. Right. And, and here's another question. Uh, J Bob in, in chat says history has taught us that people will always fight for resources. Would each of the vaults have their own identity separate from each other or would they see each other as more similar as we are vault dwellers together? and see each other as the same group and unite against everyone else who's different. Like imagine, imagine the enclave or the brotherhood goes and starts knocking on all their doors. Do they then unite against that common foe or raiders start knocking on all their doors? They also, they start uniting against that common foe. Um, that could be a thing as well. I think that, yeah. that's a, that's an interesting, an interesting question. Um, 
And then there's the whole question of like, at what point do they start running out of resources? And now they have to deal with the, the wilds of the surface of the, the monsters on the surface and everything having to do with that, you know, and they have less experience than the wastelanders on the surface. So what kinds of deals do they broker with people on the surface to be their guides or to educate them? And like, how do you take down a death claw? What do you do when, you know, mole rats start digging into your tunnels that you're trying to connect your vaults with, you know, like, <laughs> because you haven't done right. that before. Like maybe the mole rats don't get into your vault itself, but once you start digging tunnels through the rock, the mole rats start getting in, you know, what do right. you, what do you do about that? Yeah, I I, th I think it goes back to that. Like the vault, the vault dwellers would share a, a common experience, but it would not be common with your your regular wastelanders. Like you know, let's say like the residents of Diamond City or whatever. Like they are going through their own problems and issues and different stuff. And it's like, what if a Brotherhood soldier walked in the middle of Diamond City? Everybody would be like, "Hey, that guy's weird. Um, <laughs> what's he doing here? And how can we get rid of them? Because we don't really." want that and how do you get such cool hair <laughs> <laughs> they always have cool hair <laughs> and a cool jacket where do you get the cool jacket I know, from i know he went to he went to the the uh, coats rs store the coats it's like the super duper mart yeah where do you where do you get the cool jacket from well i've got another question for you but we need to take a break and thank our patrons so we'll be right back hello there old chat good to see another of general atomic's finest still eager to serve all right, so here we are in the middle of the show. This is where we get to thank our patrons. Thank you to all of our patrons. You guys are amazing. We have a brand new patron to call out this week. Leon Leonard, maybe, or Leonhard. I don't know how to pronounce your name, M. <laughs> I probably butchered it. I apologize for that. Welcome to the Patreon. Thank you for joining us. And uh, Ryan T, if I didn't call you out last week, welcome to the Patreon as well. Thank you for being here. You guys are amazing and especially Big thank you to our Liberty Prime, our Liberty Pie Man, Jared B, and also to our Sentry Bots, Southern Rage, and Stagger and Stumble. Thank you to all of you guys for helping to support the show. You guys are amazing. And all of our other 52 patrons, you guys are nuts. Thank you so much for supporting the show. And if we've done anything to help you get through your workday, your commute, your workout, or planning how you're going to manage all of those awkward conversations with your family this Thanksgiving, then check out patreon.com slash fall lorecast and check out all the different tiers like, you know, tier four where you get merch t-shirts and stuff, or maybe even just tier one or two where you get ad free episodes and episodes early, or, you know, some of the higher tiers where you get call outs every week and get join us on future episodes of the podcast. Speaking of uh, future episodes of the podcast, the end of the week or end of the month chat episode will be coming up on the 30th, Tuesday, the 30th at 9 p.m. Eastern, our end of the month chat. So let's be talking about that on the discord. What you guys want to talk about coming up very soon. So just two episodes away. We'll see you guys in a little bit for that. And we also have a brand new review this is this is a real good one here we have um actually did i did i read beelzebub's review last week i don't think i did because laney and i were so busy did i read this one from you Be beelzebub uh gandhi's gonads this is beelzebub's uh beelzebub is one of our, our regulars in chat that's his um <laughs> that's his apple podcast name uh message from the waste five stars in a world filled with pesky raiders and feral ghouls emerges one man from the vault to give us the podcast to help us crawl out from the fallout the show takes the meat and potatoes of the backstory and really compresses it into bite-sized pieces to carry with you through the wasteland fun informative clear and concise robots with zeros thank you beelzebub will aid you across the wasteland and teach us the boundaries of our knowledge and self, as well as the Fallout universe. And his name isn't Captain Danger Robots. I always, or his name isn't Captain, I messed that up. I'm so sorry. <laughs> or his name isn't Captain Danger Robots. I always look forward to your streams, podcasts, and content in general. Thank you for being a contributing factor to making the day great. You help reset my brain and are actually great for my general mental health. Oh, that's awesome, dude. Thank you for such great content and being a general great human being, man. I know it may not mean much, but I consider you a friend, mentor, and all around stand up gentleman. I look forward to taking in more content in the future. Thank you for taking time out of your day to respond to me and so many of us out there. See you in the waste. 
Beelzebub88. Bub, super nice comments, dude. Thank you so much for that and for taking the time to to leave the review on Apple Podcasts. That's awesome, dude. And then we have, an, man, you guys are leaving really long reviews. Um, thank you so much for these. We have uh, Kilted Stag in Great Britain who wrote in and uh, left a review on Apple Podcasts and says, just as important as a pip boy, five stars, only found this podcast two weeks ago on Spotify and haven't fully caught up yet. Haven't fully caught up yet. We've got like 170 something episodes. Holy crap in two weeks, man. But I'm I'm 123 episodes in. Holy moly. Chewing through those episodes. That's amazing. But I had to set up an iTunes account just to review it so others can find it. Dude, that's awesome. So thank you so much. So where do I begin? Robots with zeros is an amazing host, extremely knowledgeable and with his smooth voice, which must be level 15 charisma. Holy crap will take you away into the wasteland as if he was a tour guide and explain everything there is to know about Fallout and its lore. You can tell how much work and passion has been put into every episode, and he will even make you think about how you would react to certain things personally if it was you and not your character, which I love. This podcast is a must listen or watch for any Fallout fan. Dare I say it's just as important as a pit boy? Yes, I dare too. It will help you through any bad day, through work, through your walk, or accept a uh, use routine. I don't know what that means, but I'm just reading it as it says it. Or you can even listen to it instead of your Pip boy radio. The only thing I would change would be finding it sooner. So from the highlands of Scotland, I thank you robots for this amazing podcast and the network. I can't wait to see where it goes in the future. You deserve way more than five stars. Dude, I wish I could do a really good Scottish accent and read it that way, but I can't, and it would just mangle it up. But thank you so much, Kilted Stag. That is awesome, guys. Thank you so much for those. And um, these really, really do help get more attention to the show. So very, very appreciated. And thank you to all of our patrons. You guys are awesome. All right, we've got more stuff to talk about with this What If episode. So here we go. If you have any questions about Nuka World, I'd be delighted to answer them. All right, so... Let's take on the other scenario. Dave, what do you think would happen if they did have the experiments, similar experiments, or maybe even the same exact experiments going on in these vaults, but they were safe and the participants understood the ramifications of what was going on. They volunteered for them. The, there were clear boundaries. They, these were not like surprise experiments. And they actually got real data and the experiments didn't fall apart. They they were able to go on like nobody rebelled. Nothing weird happened. Nothing broke down. Would we end up with an actually more informed, more scientifically literate, more. I don't know, capable wasteland in the end. Uh, yeah, that's that's a great question. And. I've been looking through, I've been looking through during the break, the, the experiments for the different vaults. Uh, I pulled them up here and I'm trying to think about if there was an experiment that like promoted, like that, that the, even if they, you know, th this is in a what if scenario. So sure. these experiments all failed, but was there anything that even though it failed, it ended up being a really good outcome. And I didn't, I didn't see much of anything. Um, but there's some like there's some vaults that are like oh we're you know like the one in um fall at new vegas that has all the plant monsters in there like they were looking into uh wasn't it like it was like plants that didn't need sunlight in fall at new vegas yeah. um yeah and like that kind of more food right you would you would then have that effect on the on the world itself um right more food uh what about like the the cloning experiments Right. Yeah. The, the cloning experiments, um, the, um, what, the ability the one with to Stradivarius from that was in the, the VR, the, the yeah. little egg pods, like would yeah. people just be living in the egg pods? Like, Oh, come on in. We've got more egg pods for people come in here and be in, you know, maybe join, maybe join Mark Zuckerberg in the metaverse. Um, or, 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 but like, imagine if people were going into these, uh, VR situations and able to test scenarios safely in a VR situation, then they could be testing out ways to say take on creatures that would be too dangerous to fight or designing weapons uh without necessarily needing the resources available for them 
in that situation. You know, there's there's a lot of things you could be testing in a mm-hmm. in a VR environment theoretically without necessarily needing the resources to do it in the real world and then getting the resources once you've thoroughly tested it. Assuming right. that they have the engineering and the coding to to make it as realistic as possible, right? So, um, but if you're doing like the, um, uh, the, the Mars experiment that, um, like people will go out in the desert and, and seal themselves off and be like, okay, we're going to act like we're on a Mars colony. And for a month, we're just going to live out here and wear the spacesuits and, and, and make our own food. Like we're living on Mars. Um, I, I think that you would be more likely to have that stuff in the years after the vaults close if they were to, you know, okay, this is the experiment. We're going to run people through like survival training. Let's do combat training. Yeah. Like they have yeah. all the, like from um uh the broken not broken steel but the the one where they go to alaska and fall out three uh, yeah yeah, the name, yeah. um yes i know operation anchorage yes yeah right um like that is like essentially like a, a call of duty game within fallout three, but that's also combat training for people that, right. Oh, I can go in there and, and do this thing. And it's no big deal. Right. Like I can just um, right. shoot people and, and, and figure out how to work a gun and figure out like, what's well, a tactical maneuver for this kind of stuff. That way, if you're going out into the world, um, you are way more informed from a, you know, not necessarily a hundred percent practical perspective, but probably the best that you can do. Well, an informational perspective, tactically with your mind, you could be trained into how to like, what if the vault factions armies were actually more mentally trained for combat against the things in the wastelands. And like you said, when the dwarven hordes came down from their mountains, they were actually very formidable because one they were armed with pre-war weapons that still worked because they kept them in good condition in their vaults the engineers kept them working and then they were also trained tactically and prepared because they were in vr situations where they got to train themselves mentally with how to how to move in formation how to not injure each other or shoot people who were on the same side you know like weapons can be very dangerous if you've ever gone to a gun range and you've shot a gun like you actually have to practice doing it. It's not like it's not like Call of Duty where you just point and shoot like guns require training. They, they there's a lot of a kickback in it. They they hurt like the uh, the amount of kickback a gun has in your hand is, is physically exhausting when you shoot it regularly. Um, you have to reload. There's coordination involved. There's a lot to wielding a weapon. Um, right. And then being able to do that in a VR situation at least mitigates some of that training. It's not all of it, but there's some of the, the mental side of that training gets uh, reduced. Um, but what about the cloning stuff? What about the, the, you know, the need for protein? If you can clone Brahmin in the wasteland, then all of a sudden you have enough protein to feed everybody. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and you, you don't need to cr- clone Gary anymore. You're not going to have Gary <laughs> running around, but, but you get a bunch of Brahmin running around. It doesn't matter if they're all the same, you know, Betty the Brahmin. Right. Over and, and over but, again. And like, even if you're cloning Gary, like what if you've like <laughs> deduced a like super soldier kind of situation and essentially you have vault stormtroopers that you, you, <laughs> it's like Star Wars and it's like Attack of the Clones. It's like, all right, you know what? These guys are our infinite army that we can just like power up whenever we want to. Send against um, the super mutants. <laughs> <laughs> the army of Gary's. Um, that's, that's episode Gary, two. Uh, pew, Attack pew, of the Gary's. Pew, Gary. Pew, pew, pew. <laughs> oh man, <laughs> somebody needs to make a Gary combat mod where they're all like <laughs> weaponized, and you can send them against enemies, and they just they just all, they only follow like attack or like run away. Like those are the two. It's it's not retreat. It's like run away in a Monty Python run film. Run away, yes. and they all go Gary, and then they run away. <laughs> yeah i th- i think that <laughs> there's some experiments that would be interesting to see be like done and not ha- have like the weirdness of like oh i'm gonna you know cosplay as a little girl that also is trying to kill everyone in the simulation <laughs> sure. like if you were to go into those and say okay this is a thing but there's other experiments like um where they had to sacrifice somebody every year and that was just the experiment of it yeah um, that that there's no way that to walk away from that and be like, hey, you know, that was a great time. <laughs> was, we all had fun. We all just, right. that was a pleasant experience. Yeah. That was more There's of no a way. psychological, you would find out psychological. And I guess you, you could end the experiment like at the decision before they actually have to follow through with it. 
mm -hmm. then take another group and like subsection the groups and there's ways of doing that safely but you would quickly learn some things about humanity that might change the way that you uh organize your government structure that might Could change be. things I yeah, now that you put it that way, it's like a, a like a reality show. Like at the end of every week, somebody gets voted off of whatever it is. Right. Um, yeah, and they disappear yeah. for the group, and maybe the group thinks they've been killed until yeah. the experiment's over. So it's um, like Survivor, and they get voted off and have to live on a separate island away from people, and then oh, surprise, they're back from right. the old island. <laughs> oh, they're back. They're back in the right. vault. <laughs> what do we do now? Um, yeah, yeah, there's there's ways that you could... I think there are things that you could probably learn from each of these vaults because each of them were designed around some specific thing they were trying to trying to learn and that knowledge could be used in, in ways that could be beneficial, potentially. Um, some vaults more than others. I guess the big question then is, assuming that the vaults are safe and they're acquiring all of this knowledge, they have better use of food, better use of weapons, better use of... Um, Heck, even even some of the um, uh, the uh, what was it? What are they called? The uh, the kits they have that like can grow food the, and the Garden of Eden creation. Yeah, yeah, kit. yeah, yeah, yeah. The Gex, um, like some of those were in vaults and ready to be used, and then they ended up like being misused or misplaced or destroyed right. or you know there's somehow lots of that. harold got a hold of one of those right and then that was old mass, you know? <laughs> right like if those were better used you end up with a system I, the big question in the end is if the vaults were safe 200 years later could we have ended up with a wasteland that was rehabilitated would there have been zones in america where people were relatively safe would we have could we have created like walled cities where people were living regular lives, repopulating, maybe keeping the mutants out, getting yeah. back to some semblance of a normal life? Could that have would this have been a solution to get us back to that? I think I think that's a great question. And it's hard. It's hard not to get you know, to think about the politics of it, because when I think about um, what are the, the big threats to wastelanders out there, like, of course, there's ghouls and super mutants. But if you are a settler and you're trying to, you know, live in a ramshackle shack down by the Red Rocket Station, you're worried about raiders. And raiders are not a, a thing because of the vaults. They are a thing because of uh, they're kind of like extremist capitalists at that point. Like these are people that are like, Hey, we're out for us. We're out here to go. And, um, you know, we had a broken system of capitalism before all of this, like that's even more so in fallout where, um, you know, in, in that whole world and, and what was going on before, um, the bombs fell, that is a symptom of, of stuff, but like, that is not a symptom of the bombs falling. That is just an after effect of people are already in that mindset. Like if you look at, um, yeah. at, at fallout 76, um, with the Raider faction, the, how the Raiders started was they were up on a hill and they were like, Hey, we need stuff, uh, to live because we're just up here at our ski resorts and we can't, we can't do anything. We don't have any resources up here. And so we need stuff from the, the lower cities like Charleston or Morgantown in, in fall at 76. And so the Charleston and Morgantown people are like, yeah, we can't help you. You're too far away. And they're like, Hey, you know what? Screw you. We'll just come and take it. Like <laughs> it, it, that, that mentality isn't going away. So I don't think, right. right. I don't think that there's, there would be a rehabilitation because you would still, you would still have issues. You would have a definitely like a more likable faction, like the, the Minutemen. like essentially they're just mm. like a real nice brotherhood of steel. Like the brotherhood <laughs> of steel can be a little, a little weird sometimes and a little xenophobic. Uh -huh. um, they, they would end up being likable, like uh, the Minutemen or uh, the railroad or the responders, um, you know, maybe um, uh, like, you know, this, the city people like the diamond city people are, are perfect fine the yeah, there, there's um, always uh, rivet city people there's always some there are some groups that have more altruistic uh goals right and then right. there's always other groups that kind of ruin it for everybody <laughs> like it kind of goes back and forth right um and and i i think the other thing here is that at least to me it seems like there's there's an there are enough urban areas with vaults in and around them across the United States, because the United States is a big place. There's a lot of urban centers. Every every state has some urban center, if not two or three urban centers. 
that it's it's almost like a statistic problem, right? Given enough situations, a few of them would turn out okay. I I think a few of them would turn out okay. Like it's like planting seeds. And yeah, if you, if you walked around in like rough earth that was not very well tilled ground, it's not great soil and you spread enough seeds, a few of those seeds would still grow. Yeah, S- some places are able to figure it out. And, and even if you look at the end of um, Fallout 4 or Fallout 3, depending on your choices, um, if you like sided with the railroad or the Minutemen where it was like, hey, we love everybody. We're trying to build a better place like it would be interesting to go into the into the the game like years later and say, OK, what effect did that have? How did that change? Uh, you know, I destroyed the sense. I destroyed the Brotherhood of Steel. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I, I took down the Raiders like we've got more technology. We've got more stuff going on. Like, how would that look years like that would have a dramatic effect? There would be less conflict. Same thing for Fallout 3. If you've got a strong altruistic Brotherhood of Steel run in DC, taking care of them all. And you kind of got that with the um with the DLC that they did after where they were like, we're setting up checkpoints and giving out free water and yeah and doing these you yeah. know kind of public access programs and there's more Brotherhood of Steel members and um generally more resources. Like you can see an upward path that when people have um, have the resources to do something they're gonna they're going to do it whether it's it's good or bad so i i think that's a good that's a good point in the case of the vaults where if they got their stuff together and right off the bat we're like hey we're out there we're gonna try to improve the situation for ourselves for these people we're going to like slowly if you know all the boxes get ticked correctly i think that you're right that you could see some cities say okay you know what this is a pretty safe you know it's not the safest place to live but sure darn tootin it's pretty good yeah because i mean you see it with vault 76 the overseer very much wanted that to be the situation right and then everything good you know she, she leaves and she's like oh man this is a mess mm-hmm. <laughs> this is rough we got to do what we can but this is a this is rough and she's still trying to make things work out and imagine imagine if the other vaults in the area all left at the same time if they were all set to you know evacuate after 25 years and meet at a certain spot and work together to try to revitalize the community together that would be a completely yeah. different situation she she wouldn't be alone that she would have other people around her and they would all have their resources and be able to pull together and maybe they'd work together maybe they wouldn't but if you multiply that a- across the country and there are a hundred of these communities across the country some of them will work out just statistically I- speaking a few of them will work out that's my theory on it at least yeah i think you're right i i think that I think though that reinforces the haves and the have nots. And yeah. then yeah. it's kind of like, it's kind of like in, in zombie films and TV, like the yeah. more people you have in one place, the bigger, the danger could possibly be. Right. Well, yeah. Um, Cause it, it could go, it could go bad. You know, you have, let's say you have uh let's, let's play that out. You have a community. Let's yeah. say, let's say, uh, let's say West Virginia works out. Let's say, you know, they build a community at Charleston. Right. And Charleston is a nice community. And after a few years, they've got 2000 people living there and they're working together. Well, that becomes a really tempting location for a bunch of raiders to get together and try to ransack or a bunch of super mutants to try to ransack because there's going to be a lot of resources there. And, you know, like it's a safer place because of numbers, but it's also a much more tempting location to try to loot at the same time. Yep. Yeah. So that's true. It plays both ways. So, yeah, man. Well, that's uh, that's as far as my questions go with it. And as far as my theories go on it, I think that I think that if the vaults are safer, it's generally a better solution for the wasteland. But it also leads to other problems and difficulties as well. I think that it kind of it, it sets us up for kind of a mix of things, which creates a very different kind of fallout experience. Yeah. My last question is a, is a personal question for you. Uh-huh. If you were in the kitchen and you were cooking up all the vaults <laughs> and like the idea of the what if situation is they all open at the same time and all get together. Uh-huh. How far are you setting that ticker? Mm, mm. Well, uh, is, is this like 
Fallout physics? Or is this like real world physics? Uh, Fallout physics. Okay, because sure. in real world physics, uh, the radiation doesn't last 200 years, right? Right. Like uh, you know, Nagasaki and those places, like the, the radiation went, went away fairly quickly there's like Um, super blooms and 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 all that like actual science behind it but if you are you don't have to wait a hundred years for the radiation to go away but in fallout world radiation sticks around a long time um yeah i i think well i you have to look at it from the perspective of what they knew before the bombs dropped and i would assume that the scientists would have known that the radiation was going to stick around a while um, I don't think they knew that the there was going to be a mutant problem. The people creating mm-hmm. the balls didn't know that the FEV was going to create like mutants across the wasteland. So they didn't know that was going to be a danger, but they they probably could have predicted that there was going to be a scarcity of food and supplies and things like that. So you would have, you know, people wandering the wasteland, looking at the, the remnants scavenging and fighting over stuff. So there would be some danger there. Mm-hmm. Um, I I think you probably would wait I don't know that you would, I mean, you wouldn't know how irradiated it would be. So I think you would probably wait about, I think 20, 25 years is probably pretty good because you would want to have the people who went in still around to be able to pass on the knowledge to the younger people who are now adults, but still be around to direct them and let them know like where things are. Like this is the city where we live. This is a good zone to be. This is where you would want to go. This is where you know, crops used to grow. And so hopefully the crops and land is still good. Or, you know, this is a uh, industrial area. So you're going to be able to find good resources here for steel or lumber, you know, like uh, you're not going to knowledge is invaluable. Yeah, I understand. You're not going to want to wait a hundred years into the future because that kind of knowledge, unless you wrote it all down and then, but even then, you know, four generations in the future, they're going to have to like look all that stuff up and try to figure out what's going on. And who knows after a hundred years, what the world has changed? Like what have the people on the surface done to all of that material? Right. Yeah. It's kind of like the problem with Moira's wasteland survival guide. Like people could like you give her the information based off your, your choices. But I mean, you could give her like some like weird stuff about like, no landmines are perfectly fine. You just step on them and it makes yeah. a little sound that says that was easy. Right. Like, <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. You don't, you, yeah. You, you wait a hundred years and there's so much that you've lost by that point. I think you need to mm-hmm. do it within a generation. I think that the vault 76 concept makes a lot of sense in that regard. Yeah. Um, and, and if you come out and you open up that vault door and you look out and everything looks absolutely terrible, you lock it back up again and you go, Nope. <laughs> <laughs> yep we're going back in it's kind of like when you're when you're baking something in the oven you open up the oven and see oh it's not done yet all right uh, put, put it back in, it back in. <laughs> five more minutes all right here we go yep. yeah yeah i think that's what you do well i would love to hear our listeners thoughts on this concept what would happen if the vaults were safe um feel free to log into the robots radio discord look for the fallout lorecast channel and Give me your thoughts. If, if we didn't cover something that you think was obvious and you guys and you want to yell at us and be like, oh, my God, Tom, Dave, how did you miss this concept? It would totally be like this. Let us know. Or if you've got some crazy idea of what you think would happen, we would love to hear it. Um, we'll respond to you on there. Also, you can always shoot us a message on Twitter at the uh, Fall Lorecast Twitter at Fall Lorecast or at me, robots underscore radio or at Dave Chaffins. I believe that's yours, right? Yep. Yep. And Dave, do you have anything else going on? Anything else you want to share before we head out? Uh, We do the Fallout Hub sometimes. Uh, That that happens. It's a Fallout community show that me and Mr. Robots Radio here and a good friend, Kenneth the Youth, that runs Chad Fallout 76 podcast do. That's um, it's generally every two weeks. Sometimes it's every three weeks. Sometimes it's once a month. Um, It's just a great time to to pal around. And it's like three friends playing Fallout together. It's all nice and fun. And then me and Tom are um, kind of starting back up something here that I think you'd want to talk about for a little bit. Yeah, dude. Yeah, we have the most recent episode of the Starfield Lorecast came out last week with some of the recent news that came out with all the all the Skyrim 10th anniversary hub hullabaloo with uh, interviews with Mr. Todd Howard. He dropped some more information about Starfield and then some other some other stuff came out. So we're starting that back up. We're less than a year away from launch. So we're going to be getting more and more information about that. So We'll be doing Dave and I do that podcast. So we'll be doing that more and more often as we get more info drops. And then uh, we have a theory that we will get a bunch of info come E3. So June, which is only 
what is that six months seven months away at this point so it's right it's going to come hot and heavy once we get to summer yep we're doing appetizers right now but once the main course comes it's like main mm-hmm. course for years and you just you'll just be eating too busy eating your sausages to figure it out you know? absolutely this game is going to be huge so if you love bethesda games if you love fallout elder scrolls you're going to want to tune in to the starfield lorecast so go ahead and subscribe to that on your podcatcher just pull it out right now stop the podcast right now just go open it up look up starfield lorecast hit the subscribe button make sure that you're following that because we're going to give you all the news and then as the lore gets revealed for the game as more information comes out for all the different planets and the factions and all that stuff we're going to cover all of those details and get you guys all the info and especially the barking dogs behind me so um (laughs) they always bark when i do podcasts and <laughs> part of it it's yeah. part of living yeah so dogs have to bark th- like i have i have the the um the fire station also known as the uh responders uh, that drive by <laughs> my house and do all the big sirens so that's just it's just how it goes it. when you record out of your house um so mm-hmm. we're gonna have all the information that you want for starfield this will be like the starfield podcast so make sure you tune in for that and um that's that's what we got going on you know how to find all the podcasts right robotsradio.net all the stuff going on. We've got lots of cool stuff over on the Robots Radio YouTube channel where I've uh, I've been streaming some uh, some Skyrim, except for because my brain decided to attack me this week with the worst migraine I've had in like months. So I haven't done much of that, but I've been releasing some uh, some mod videos for Skyrim. And then, of course, the Fallout Lorecast YouTube channel with uh, the new video that Lainey edited together. So you should go check that out and help us grow that channel. We would really appreciate it. So reminder to go check that out. And Dave, thank you for joining me. This has been super fun, dude. Yeah, it's a pleasure. Anytime, my friend. Awesome. Awesome. Well, we'll have to have you back soon. And chat, thank you for being here in the live stream. And everybody, we will see you again next week. And until then, stay safe in the wasteland. And if you see a vault, remember that they aren't actually safe. They're very dangerous places. And if you hear somebody yelling, yelling, Gary, there's probably like 12 other guys right behind him. All right. We'll see you guys next time. Later. Plug into everything else we're doing, check out robotsradio.net. Also, look up the Robots Radio YouTube for videos about Fallout and other things. And check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash robotsradio. You've been listening to a Robots Radio podcast. Smart shows for interesting people. Check out all the shows at robotsradio.net.